You're on. Um, I'm Dr. Timothy Walsh. I'm here at the APA meeting, uh, and I'm going to give a lecture on anorexia nervosa, and in particular, the persistence of anorexia nervosa. Um, I've been involved with the study of eating disorders in general, anorexia nervosa, for over three decades, and it, anorexia nervosa remains a uh, perplexing, enigmatic, and fascinating disorder. Um, so in the lecture, I'm going to try to go through some of the basics about what we know, what we know about it, um, which should be just reminders for, for most up-to-date psychiatrists, but just as a, as a, as a point of uh, giving people a, rem a reminder of what important facts are to know. Um, in addition, I'm going to sketch out some new information, that, relatively new information, about what we know about treatment. And one of the major advances in the last decade or 15 years has been the development and um, documentation of the utility of what's come to be known as the Maudsley Method, which involves the family for treating adolescents with anorexia nervosa. And that is currently the best evidence-based treatment for anorexia nervosa, but the evidence only exists for adolescents. Um, for and the other thing I'll note going through those data are that the youngsters who develop anorexia nervosa, in general, whether they get the Maudsley method, the family-based treatment, or a good control comparison treatment, tend to do well, and tend to do well over time. In contrast, um, on average, the treatment of individuals who are older and have had the illness longer, and longer I only mean five to ten years, um, is in general much more challenging and difficult. Um, and there, we don't have anywhere near as good treatments as we need to have. I think there's a consensus about that for the, for the adults. <clears throat> so the question that I've been led to wonder about, that I've been led to wonder about, is how is it, once this disorder gets established, does it become so persistent and so refractory to interventions that you would think would be more effective than they are? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in the process of thinking about this, I've come up with a hypothesis, which I hope to spell out in some detail in the lecture. Um, and it has to do with um, how humans, and actually how at least mammals, learn behavior, how they pick up behavior patterns, and how those patterns turn into habits. Um, and what I've learned from reading and talking to some a number of cognitive neuroscientists in the last several years is a lot of that has been worked out uh, to an impressive and interesting degree. So, not surprisingly, you pick up a new behavior uh, and a laboratory animal picks up a new behavior because it's rewarding. Mm -hmm. they, they get something uh, at the end of the behavior that they want to get, like a piece of food. Um, and there's parallels in humans. We tend to do things because we get a desired outcome. Um, but if that outcome is uh, only occasional or not consistent, we never really pick it up. We'll keep trying whatever that behavior is. The rat right. will still push the lever occasionally, but not consistently. However, <clears throat> it's been well worked out now that if you uh, overtrain the behavior, <clears throat> so if for a while the rat gets cheese uh, every time it pushes the lever, um, it eventually learns to press the lever whether or not there's cheese. Hmm. So this is referred to as stimulus response learning. So it's the stimulus, the presence of the lever, that leads to the response, hmm. and it becomes relatively independent of whether the reward is there. <clears throat> so the hypothesis that I'm going to pose is that over time, the dieting behavior of anorexia nervosa becomes habitual and really engraved in the brain. Um, and it's that that makes it particularly hard to eradicate. Now, I should emphasize this is not a complete theory of all of anorexia nervosa. It says very little about why people get it, 
Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't directly, although it indirectly um, discusses uh, some, uh, some of the aspects of emotional regulation because that's one of the triggers pretty clearly for dieting and weight loss is an attempt to regulate emotion. Mm -hmm. um, and this, if, one of the reasons to keep doing the behavior is because at least some of the time you feel better or less worse. So that reinforces the behavior too. Yeah. So the case I'll make, and I've got other details of the case, that um, the alignment of stars during adolescence um, builds to weight loss being very rewarding, being overtrained, practiced a lot, because you're not going to lose weight unless you diet a lot, right. and it's effective. <clears throat> it's very rewarding at the beginning, and it helps people avoid unpleasant emotion. So over time, it gets very trained and very habitual, very built in, and, and very good. Hypothesis is engra engraved in the brain and in its circuits, and therefore is much more challenging for us to eradicate, <clears throat> for the patient to eradicate, and for us to help him or her eradicate it. Um, it. This thinking helps explain a few things. It does help explain why adolescents do better uh, in general. They've had less time to practice. The habit is not as well established. Um, it, it helps explain the similarity, the perplexing similarities in terms of behavior and thinking between anorexia nervosa and substance use disorders. There's this narrowing of interest and obsession with doing one thing and getting one result, in this case weight loss. Um, and this model suggests that's not because they're addicted to a substance, it's because the circuit that is involved in learning habitual behavior is based on reward. It's the same circuit that's involved in learning that cocaine is a rewarding drug. So there's a similar neuro, neural pathways are involved, and I would suggest that accounts for some of those strong parallels between substance use and anorexia nervosa. Thanks very much, Dr. Walsh. That's great.